Hi, everyone. Welcome to Food Talk Live. A reminder that this episode will also appear on our podcast, Food Talk with Danny Nirenberg. So please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. It, it really means a lot to me if you do that. Um, today, I get to chat with somebody I've admired for so long and his, who has really been a good friend to uh, Food Tank, and that's Dr. Lawrence Haddad, who is the executive director of the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition or GAIN. And they're a nonprofit working with businesses and governments throughout the world to really improve people's access to nutritious food. He is also the recipient of the 2018 World Food Prize along with David Navarro and has been, again, so supportive of Food Tank's work. Um, he's joining us uh, in the evening for him from the uh, from Brighton, UK. Lawrence, such a pleasure to see you and I'm so glad to know that you're safe and, and thank you for joining us. My pleasure, Danny. It's great to see you. Great to know you're safe too. So, uh, you know, it, it's hard to know where to begin. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, this this pandemic has changed so many uh, things for us, and it's a uh, you know made me more and more concerned about the state of of the world's hungry. And and before uh, COVID nineteen, pre COVID, uh, one in three people worldwide uh, were were malnourished. And, you know, that's a staggering number in itself. And I, I suspect, you know, evidence is all pointing that way that, you know, this pandemic will increase the number of hungry people in the world. And I just want to get your sort of thoughts on where we stand in, in terms of, of not only fighting hunger around the globe uh, during this pandemic, but also making sure that people have access to, you know, the foods that GAIN has really been promoting for so long foods that actually nourish people. Mm. This is, um, you're right, Danny, it's uh, it's kind of an unprecedented situation. It, when you look back at the 2008 food price crisis, that was all about drought and oil prices and fertilizer prices and biofuels. So it was, it was really a production shock, but this is kind of an everything shock. Right. This is, the whole food system has been disrupted. People can't, you can't grow food. What you can grow, you can't harvest. What you can harvest, you can't move. What you can move, you can't process. What you can process, you can't sell. So it's 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 a it's a mess. And um, what we're seeing is uh, you know piles of food over here rotting. They can't get to hungry people over here. So if you look at the income numbers, you, so you have the the food supply chains have been totally disrupted, but you've also got livelihoods disrupted. People losing their job, losing their work. People like you and me, we can kind of continue to work. We're not dependent on our physical labor. We're not dependent on being in a certain place at a certain time. People who depend on their physical labor, they lose their jobs. Incomes plummet. The latest estimates I'm seeing say 10% global GDP declines. And if you think about global GDP declining by 10%, you know you're going to have big hunger numbers. You know you're going to have big malnutrition numbers. So it's it's it's... You know, all the all the curves are going to be changing direction. Yeah, and you know, I've been talking to experts on this show for you know the last eight weeks now, and one of the things that concerns me is that since two thousand eight and you know two thousand nine and again in two thousand eleven, I feel like we made really big strides in this idea that that gain works so hard to promote, and this idea of not just focusing on calories. But really focusing on, on nourishing foods and, and figuring out, you know, how to do that in culturally relevant ways, in ways that people will accept, and and and, and making those foods more and more available, mm. encouraging governments and the private sector to invest in them. How concerned are you that all of that that good work that's been done over the last decade will will sort of you know will take some steps backward? Well, we're certainly taking steps backward. I mean, the fact that people have less income means that they're going to be um, purchasing less diverse diets, more cereals, more roots, sure. less animal source foods, less fruits, vegetables, um, less pulses, things that are really important for micronutrients and proteins. So um, in addition, we've got these price spikes in, in some of these key foods. So what we're doing, again, in the 10 countries where we have uh, offices in the field, we're, we're doing three things. We're focusing on, number one, keeping smaller medium enterprises going a lot of these small and medium enterprises that produce process and distribute fruits vegetables eggs dairy beans they are they don't have any working capital you know they're very right. little if they're 
if they people if they don't get paid if their invoices are not paid within a month they're out of business right so we're trying very hard to get finance to them grants to them loans to them and to help them get ready to receive government programs if any government mm -hmm. programs come forth because you know that you have to register for it and a lot of the smes don't know how to register right online. so we're helping them that's the first thing we're doing second thing we're doing is keeping food system workers healthy and hungry uh, healthy and well fed and mm -hmm. What's what's interesting is you, you see it in in Baltimore in Brighton where I live, it, people have become much more aware of where their food comes from mm -hmm. and much more aware that their food their food supplies are things they not, normally don't think about. Right. Certainly, if they're middle income or high income, right. they don't right. think about it. But now all of a sudden they're thinking about it. And in the UK, food system workers have 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 assumed the status of essential frontline workers. Exactly. And I think. That has that's been you know one of the one of the few positives coming out of this this tragedy uh, is that the the realization of the importance of food system workers. So we've been trying very hard to keep their nutrition going, helping employers to keep the the, the feeding uh, the the food uh, the food servings on the job nutritious, helping um, keep breastfeeding facilities open so that women can continue to breastfeed uh, on when they're at work keeping um whenever there's any messaging around hand washing making sure that nutrition is in there as well right. so just keeping all of that going keeping these guys safe they're they're often they're working but they're very poor uh right. they're working on on contracts that can be you know terminated at right. the drop of a hat right. um they're very young very often they're supporting elderly people in their households so keeping them going third thing we're doing is keeping food markets open especially Kind of the wet markets, the markets that uh, that sell lots of fresh produce and very often have live live animals uh, there as well. So keeping them open and keeping them safe. A lot of governments are just shutting them down. Right. And of course, if you shut them down because of infection worries or food safety worries, you're also shutting down access to food. And so we're working with them on on uh, protocol, safety protocols, equipment. Um, you know, what can you do to safely keep these markets open? So those three things. The other thing we're doing, Danny, and I've been really shocked by this, is the lack of data right. that are telling us what's going on. Right. We've been, I've been, I've been getting um, country reports from the 10 country directors uh, of GAIN, and they're very sort of impressionistic. They're, what's happening in the news? What are you hearing the government doing? Right. What's happening in local markets? They're, we're putting that together and distributing it, and it seems to be gobbled up by a wide range of people, and that just makes me realize how poor our data systems are. We have these fantastic dashboards telling us what's going on day by day right. on, on the crisis, but nothing on food prices, for example. Absolutely, and that's something I've heard over and over again, whether it's from technology uh, companies or mm -hmm. nonprofits, like yours, the, the, the total lack of data about what's really happening. And yeah, I, I think, you know, it, it, it is a case of what we don't, what we can't measure, we don't know how to fix. And so this is, it's more important than ever to use all of these amazing technologies that have been developed over the last decade to really mm. put that together in a usable way for organizations like yours and for governments. Yeah, it's been a real wake up call and we're gonna, we're gonna do a lot more on, on real time data, you know, at least week by week stuff. And we'll make an investment in that. And I, I hope others will too. I know the World Food Programme is trying to do some more on this USAID uh, and lots of other people. Um, one of the one of the really uh, encouraging things I think I've seen is the uh, the research community. So okay. to gain also is an avid consumer of research, and we generate uh, we generate some research too. And I've seen the research community in nutrition really been inspired actually by the health health com health research community, right. and they're coming together. And we're involved with a, with hundreds of others in something called Standing Together for Nutrition. Uh, and it's it's I've never seen so much data sharing, um, figuring out how does your model connect to my model so that we can predict income changes, food price changes, nutrition changes, and child mortality changes. I've never seen those linkages happen before. So again, that's something good that's coming out of this that I hope endures when when we're past the worst of it. Yeah, that's real silo breaking, which you, you know I know you've been talking about it for years. I've been like you know beating that drum for a long time. But I mean, maybe it took and despite yeah. that, this is a terrible tragedy. There's no no way around that. But I mean, it maybe it takes a crisis like this one 
um, to, to force people to start working together. I was hoping that, you know, all the work that was being done around the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals set out by the United Nations, and, you know, of course, climate change, that that would bring us together in, in different ways. And that never really seemed to happen. So maybe maybe COVID-19, you know, this is that, that silver lining from it. And, and, you know, I'm sure your other, your other guests have said this, but we really, you know, the Chinese symbol for, um, for crisis is threat and opportunity, those two symbols put together. And so we need to really um, need to make the most of the opportunity. And I think, I think we will do that. I think there are some things that you can do now that will, you know, most, most, development, hap it, most development decisions are made in, in the midst of crises, actually. You make decisions now, they will have longer term effects. And um, I think there are some things we can do to, to build build our systems back better. The one thing I'm, I'm really worried about though, Danny, is um, policymakers and governments haven't really clocked onto the fact that kids who are, who right. suffer, who suffer, you know, from disruptions in their own food supply chains, right. whether it's not, whether it's an umbilical cord or breast milk, breastfeeding, or, you know, complementary foods that young children eat. If that breaks down, uh, you know, you've heard me say this before, it's a bit like wet concrete. Right. If wet concrete is, is, is distorted in some way, it's really, you can't really change it. And right. kids' brains at a very young age, their immune systems at a very young age are like that. So we, there's a lot of talk about bouncing back and V-shaped bounce backs in the economy and the number of hungry people will, will quickly reduce. But there's no bouncing back for those those kids that are suffering in the first thousand days post conception, and so yeah. I've been a bit shocked at the slowness of the response to policymakers to that. Yeah, we had a uh, Roger Thoreau from the Global Council, uh, sorry, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, and he was, you know, talking about the same thing and looking back on, you know, a young a young man now that he followed since 2003 who who experienced uh, stunting during the famine in Ethiopia. And you know now this this young man is 21 years old and in the fourth grade, and mm. the the long term effects of, of of you know malnourishment and stunting very very early on from from pregnancy you know throughout childhood it's it's devastating it's, it's tragic and it it sets up countries mm -hmm. earlier much later on the the effects of what's happening now will be seen for decades. It's it's really you know the a lot of the I, I come from a research background, Danny, as you know, and a lot of the research that says what what is what is an early childhood uh, boost or or de or, uh, or um, deprivation? What does that do to a kid twenty or thirty years down the road? A lot of that research was from Guatemala, and it was it was looking at the difference between intervention A and intervention B, and they were both positive interventions, but intervention A. Uh, had the the long term consequences were massive. You know, kids earning uh, as adults uh, forty percent more income, being fifty percent less likely to be in poverty. These are big. So you can imagine a relatively small impact in Guatemala twenty or thirty years ago, uh, manifesting itself today. Imagine what this is going to do in twenty or thirty years' time. That's the legacy of this thing, and that's you know, our ability to combat that will be our legacy. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, you and, and David Navarro won the World Food Prize in 2018 for this focus on, on childhood uh, nourishment and, and um, maternal nutrition. You know, we were talking um, a few days ago to um, uh, one of the directors of gender programs at CARE, uh, and she joined us from, from Nairobi. And, you know, this is, you know, she was telling, you, you and I know this, uh, what I'm about to say, but she was saying how women uh, tend to suffer more during crises like these, whether it's a, a hurricane or a drought or, or whatever, because food um, is, is portioned out in a way that men and boys tend to get it first. And, and, and girls and women, you know, tend to eat less during crises like these. What is the effect, you know, we're, we're talking about stunting, you know, from, from the umbilical cord to, to uh, uh, early childhood development. What effect is this having on women in, in some of the countries that, that GAIN works in right now? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's going to have a really devastating effect on, because women are always the shock absorbers right. when it comes to any kind of crisis, whether it's small, small or big or... 
that apparent, apparently men think that their their time is completely elastic and they can do they can do a billion of things and sleeping and eating isn't one of them and it's not just eating and it's not just they eat least and last they they're the last to get health care they're the last to get clean water you know they're the last to get everything pretty much in most uh, most society, well, many societies coupled to that they they have the least control over over their time over their bodies over over, over, over a whole range of resources so we're doing a lot we're really stepping up a lot to to do to do to try to mitigate some of this um this effect we're working very hard with female entrepreneurs right. we're working especially hard with young women who are working in the food system we're paying a lot of attention to disaggregating uh data to really track what's happening to women we're working a lot a lot of the a lot of the people who work in in market stalls uh and are the most exposed are women so we're, we're trying to do a lot of stuff um, with that because um, this crisis has, you know, it, it's 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 revealed inequalities and inequalities drive the crisis. It's a bit like HIV AIDS, you know, HIV AIDS and, in, and inequality sort of supercharge each other. And we have to break that, that downward spiral. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the crisis has exposed so many things, but I think what it will deepen is gender gender inequality for sure. And, yeah. and a lot of other inequalities. You were talking about frontline workers before. Yeah. Now, and even though they're very visible right now, um, companies, for example, in the U.S., have stopped giving them hazard pay. You know, they're. they're I think we're already forgetting how important they are in in some places. So it's it's essential that the equality side and the real visibility side of this um, mm. is is pushed forward throughout the crisis. I, I want to go back, to, if if that's okay. To, to yeah. The you were talking about, you know, um, keeping food markets open and, and keeping those wet markets that often have the, you know, some of the most nutritious foods available. Mm -hmm. You know, it, again, it's women who are doing the shopping. It's women who are, you know, uh, as you said, humaning, womaning the stalls. They're, they're the people who are selling the food often. What are some ways that, you know, they are, are protecting themselves? Because when I've been to wet markets and in places in the world, they're very crowded. They're very vibrant. They're, you know, there's there's so much going on. How do you create a situation where people are safe? Well, you know, it's 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 not rocket science. Uh, it's difficult to it's difficult to, to police it and to, and to monitor it and enforce it. But it's about spacing. And so there's you can put spacing tape down on on the on the concrete and if there isn't concrete you can mark it out with string it's about making sure there are masks it's about making sure there are you know it's the sort of things that we worry about here make sure there's sanitation uh, hand sanitizers around uh protocols about handling food different types of food if you handle this food then you have to wash your hands before you handle that food it's about uh, making sure there are gaps between people who are lining up to to buy something it's about um it's, it's almost about washing. It's about washing the money if there's money changing hands. Right. Um, it, it's it's about equipment. Uh, it's about um, inspections. Um, it's it's just it's just uh, nuts and bolts. Right, right, absolutely. Uh, but for a lot of the countries that you're working in, I, I, we were talking before we started recording about the lack of PPE uh, mm -hmm. equipment in the, or PPE in, in the United yeah. States. And, and, and also in other parts of the world that are, you know, richer than many of the countries that you're working in. How, how I mean, it, you know, obviously these things are needed, but it's getting them to the people who need them. And, and it, you know, having governments facilitate that process, that's not going to be easy. No, I mean, some of the governments have been quite good, uh, especially some of our Asian uh, partners have been pretty good at getting um, masks to people serving uh, food, especially at the front lines. Um, so that's been good. I don't, I don't really know how they've done it, actually, uh, but they have done it. And of course, in Asia, there's much less stigma about wearing masks. And, and of course, those, those, many of those countries have been um, sort of prepared almost for this by, by bird flu, um, uh, right. the avian flu. Um, so they, they're, they're not ready, but they're readier than many of the rest of us. Uh, it's it's Africa that I really worry about, uh, right. and I'm quite puzzled about what's going on with the numbers in Africa in terms of infection rates. I'm right. no epidemi I'm no epidemiologist, and I I just don't know whether it's because the populations are younger, whether it's something to do with the temperature, something it's whether they did lockdowns, 
um, earlier on than the European countries or whether it's population density. I, I just don't know what's going on there. It's, it's going yeah. to be really interesting. Yeah, it, it, it will be interesting. So whether it's just under-reporting, Danny, it may just be I, that. Well, I mean, uh, yeah, my um, my husband's an ag economist and he works a lot. I mean, obviously not now, but, you know, he knows a lot about Malawi and Zambia and the numbers coming out of Malawi are very conflicting. So it is a huge data problem. And, and you know, having that data available, I think will be very useful. But no mm. one really knows what's going on. And that's that's very scary to me. Yeah, it is scary. And this this tension because of that lack of data. Uh, not not really knowing what's going on. There's there's a real. I've been re reading lots of reports, including some from our own partners and and own uh, constituents that we work with, people who are at risk of malnutrition. Many of them are saying, "Look, I'd rather die from the virus than die of, of hunger, right. and malnutrition." Right. So you know, just because there's this big thing happening in Europe and North America, not much is happening here. Why are you closing everything down? Yeah. I I can't work from home. I can't stockpile food. I can't get deliveries at home, um, and I, it's it's really a tough. It's very tough for policymakers in in Africa and South Asia. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, we we've talked a lot about how the crisis has created opportunities, and you work with these small and medium sized enterprises and a lot of entrepreneurs. What are the opportunities? Do you think that are are, are maybe more available to them now? during the pandemic I, i'm sure there's a lot of creativity going on among these these entrepreneurs and innovators yeah there, there really is i mean some of them are, are are sort of using they're they're sort of talking about the foods they produce as um uh, a protective food so this this is this can be kind of dangerous and kind of misleading but if they do it in the right way there's no doubt that nutritious food is you know, it's, it strengthens your immune system, right. and so and so if and so it, it stops you at least getting comorbidities, which may which may exacerbate the severity of of COVID nineteen. They're also um, taking advantage of the, of the fact that um, diabetes, hypertension, coronary heart disease, obesity, overweight these seem to also be very important comorbidities. Right. And so they're, they're, they're playing that up as well. A lot of them are taking advantage of the fact that there's a, a heightened awareness around uh, public health right now to, to um, as I said earlier, latch on to the messaging around washing your hands, eating healthy food, uh, breastfeeding your kids. Um, a lot of them are um, investing in digitization. Um, they're, they're, they're figuring out ways to do things online. They're figuring out ways to do things um, through takeout and delivery services. A lot of them are getting together to figure out how to work cooperatively to change their business models. But the, the thing they need, Danny, is they, they don't have the finance. Um, they're, they're, getting, they're, they're getting their systems up to spec as well because they know they're going to have to get their systems up to spec to receive any government handouts whenever they come so that's right. another that's another positive what's not happening enough the big the big companies especially the big multinationals are not doing enough to support the smes um diane holdoff and i she's from the world business council on sustainable development she and i wrote a blog a couple of days ago basically exhorting mnc's to do more to support the SMEs, especially the ones in their value chains, because you know you're going to need them when when the economies uh, begin to move again. You're going to need those value chains. You don't want them to to, to get you know, to to implode. You want them to still be there. So keep them going. Um, keep those SMEs going. Keep your workers going. Um, so it, there is a lot of creativity. There's a lot of creativity everywhere, actually. I mean, right. necessity is the mother of invention, right? But um, yeah. it's a tough time to be an SME. We just did a survey of 370 SMEs in the Scaling Up Nutrition uh, Business Network, SBN. And, uh, you know, 90% of them have been very badly hit by this. Yeah. And the main, the main problem is lack of working capital. Yeah. So, I mean, the same is true here for a lot of, you know, startups and, and, and smaller and, and medium sized operations who, you know, were doing incredible work and really changing the food system. And again, I, you know, as much as I try to be hopeful, I'm really scared for that sort of retraction, you know, the, all mm -hmm. those products that were made and all these nutritious foods that were being developed and distributed in different ways are now not going to be. And I, 
I think that's a it's a real thing. Yeah, I mean, some of the upsides are that there's a greater awareness around food safety now. Right. Um, so that's good. That well, I think that will continue to to go forward. Right. I think yes, the essential nature of food systems uh, will also go forward. And the argument is, you know, you can't just fix, you can't just sort the health system problem out. You have to sort the food system problem out. That's someone said. That's the sting in the tail. You know, you have to you have to fight the battle on on both fronts. Um, I think the data systems will improve. I think there'll be a greater awareness of the, the vulnerability, uh, certainly in high income and middle income populations, even in low income countries of, of chronic disease and diet related chronic disease. Um, so there is some there is some hope amidst the gloom. I think I think people are understanding more about where their food comes from. I think there'll be a greater desire to have a variety of of distances of value chains. So long value chains, not necessarily going to be seen as a good thing. Shorter right. value chains, which are seen as a bit Luddite by some people, I think will come back in into fashion. I think uh, issues of resilience will rise up the agenda with, with diversity being a key issue, diversity of where you grow food, where you buy food, where you source food. I think issues around, um, yeah, yeah. Diversity will, will be a big issue. Absolutely, absolutely. I just want to go back for a second. You you mentioned that there's a real need for the multinational uh, food and, and agribusiness community to be helping these small and yep. medium enterprises. What exactly could they be doing that they're not? Well, they can do um, uh, kind of the things I've been talking about. They can do a lot of business-to-business uh, -business support. A lot of the SMEs, um, they just need advice on how to access government programs. For example, they just need advice on how to redo their business plan uh, and how to do scenarios. So many, so many SMEs don't know how to do a scenario for what's going to happen in the next three, six, twelve months. Right. Um, they they need to they need to keep doing their um, yeah they need to pay their invoices on time. Right. Uh, lots of things they could be doing. Yeah, and those bigger bigger businesses can really be helpful with that. Yeah, thing. I mean they, they they can they can weather the storm. The smaller ones can't. Um, they, can, they can help them out with their marketing strategies. They can help them out with, um, they can help them uh, franchise refrigerators. They can do all sorts of things, really. Absolutely. Um, on the on the idea of you know more digitalization of of the food system, mm. sort of you know how SMEs are are using digital and and other technologies. Where do you see the sort of barriers? I know that you work with a lot of female entrepreneurs, but often in some of the countries that you work in, you know, women don't have uh, the best access to, you know, either cell phones, their husbands usually do, or their brothers or fathers, or they don't always have access to the internet. How, you know, that's going to become a real issue, I think, the longer that this pandemic goes on that lack of, of, you know, access and inequality when we're talking about digital technologies? I think it will. It varies a lot from country to country. I think some of the countries in West Africa, women probably have more phones or more access to phones than, than men do. Uh, but it, it definitely does. It definitely is an issue. Um, I, I don't, I, again, I don't really know what the answer is. The, I think do as much as you can on SMS with the old SMS technology. It's still really powerful and still, a lot of people still use it. Try and do as much as you can there. Um, access to information in general is is you know information is power and power shapes information. So whatever we can do, get as much information out there to female entrepreneurs, female decision makers, female heads of household. Um, mm -hmm. uh, this, this is not an easy topic. No, no, no. But you're right. Anything you can do to, you know, make sure that those those women are getting information, whatever form, and, and will be. And also them. give them opportunities to ge to generate information and, and share information about what's happening. We're we're doing quite a bit to sort of um, uh, democratize uh, and crowdsource information, and very often that's that's via telephones and. Uh, I think women, women in particular, know the price of things, and they they're more willing to share that information and not sort of hold it in and keep it in. And that's quite, uh, I think that's quite empowering to share and also to receive and, and learn about other things. So, I think one of the one of the really devastating things of the about the crisis is uh, when a lot of people have uh, given up hope. Actually, 
uh, lots of things and and then a, a lot of people feel like their agency has been taken away from them right. and i think that's that's the big that's the big thing you have to try to counter is no your your agency has been shifted and there are different opportunities and there are some things you can't do and some things you can do um but you're you still have agency you still have choices Right, absolutely. Um, we just have a comment from Bill Burke, and he says less than four percent of Malawi's officially suspected cases have been confirmed. So, how many actual cases is is a really big unknown. So that goes back to what we were talking about before. Yeah. Data. Yeah, and you know, what does the Malawian government do? Does it take on a precautionary principle and say, "Sorry, we're locking everything down," or does it say? business as usual and then and then who knows what will happen in two months time i think it's really really tough yeah so many so many unknowns uh right yeah. now uh lawrence i you know i i know you're hunkered down and brighton but you get to work with a lot of amazing people including our friend david navarro and so many others and i'm wondering who's inspiring you the most right now as you sort of watch this crisis unfold and do everything you know that you and gain can can do to to lessen the the stress of it for a lot of folks well this is going to sound really corny but there's two groups of people that are really inspiring me one one is actually gain staff i mean yeah. we we especially the ones based in africa and asia so we we you know in, in europe and north america we most of us you know we have nice places to live sure. um, we can do we can do things uh we have good internet access we can, yeah. but when you're living in you know many countries many places in africa and south asia it's these things you can't take for granted many of our staff members are living with elderly parents and right. they're there it's you know there's challenges there about so that that's i'm, I'm really impressed with our staff right. but i'm also really impressed with their creativity we asked all of our staff we asked them okay you know we run about 100 different programs in the, in the 10 countries we run we said you have to go through every program you have to say which program can you still deliver yeah. using the using the existing methods mm -hmm. which programs um do you can you still deliver but you have to change things around oh. which programs can you not deliver and you have to stop and what are the new programs you can you can you can build out in the next month and they just rose to that challenge incredibly well and it, you know it's this incredible surge of of energy and creativity, so that's impressive. Oh. And the and the people that we serve, our you know our bosses ultimately in the field, the the, the mothers, the fathers, the the sisters, the grandmothers, the SMEs, the food system workers, they're really putting their bodies on the line. They're putting their you know the SMEs, they are they they put their they put their money on the line. It's right. their money. They're putting you and I. I can't speak for you. But I I get a salary. I don't put my own money into an enterprise that might disappear off the face of the earth uh, right. in a month and and the things that they're doing to keep their businesses going and these are small business they are they employ three people ten people five people the things they're doing it's it's incredible you know they're getting money from the crowdsourcing they're right. getting money from big companies they're getting money from philanthropists that we didn't no one has even heard of they're i mean they're doing all sorts of stuff they're low they're they're hawking stuff. They're loaning stuff. They're, you know, it's, it's they're doing. They're they're incredible. They're my heroes, especially That's the entrepreneur. They're really, really heroes. That's great. Not corny at all, Lawrence. So uh, people can find more information about Gain at GainHealth.org, uh, and we'll have that information available on FoodTank.com as well as on our social media. Thanks so much for joining me today, Lawrence. You're you're a true hero to me, and I'm so impressed by all the work that Gain does. Um, uh, a reminder that this episode will also appear on our podcast, Food Talk with Danny Nirenberg. Uh, and I hope everyone will join me again when I'll be talking to Paul and Sarah, the owner of the restaurant American Meltdown. Thank you so much, Lawrence. Stay well. Danny, thank you for giving me the opportunity. Thanks for the work that Food Tank does. It's really important to give a platform, to give a voice, and to to connect people through dialogue. Uh, and I really admire what you do. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye now. Bye.